Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. This is me, Dr. Sami Abdul Khalil, and this is A to thirty A, and this is the full semester, twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five, and um, A to thirty A. A very interesting course, I promise you. It covers a very huge terrain. We're going to also cover uh, a number of genres, not only one genre and um, i think you, by now you know what a genre is we'll talk more about that later today inshallah so before i start i would like to ask if if i'm recognizable have i taught you at any point before did i teach you anything anyone if if i did i would like you to raise your hands Haya, Haya. So Haya, what did I teach you, Haya? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Hi, Haya. Ah, I studied the same subject, but I didn't finish the final. Okay. So you're doing only the final, or you're uh, you dropped the course and you're starting all over again? Yeah, I dropped the course. Okay, hey. Where are you um, based? Are you in the MAM or Riyadh or things? Yes, the MAM. The MAM. Okay, hey. Mm. I can also recognize Amr from his name. Amr Abdul Bay. Hi, Amr. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How are you, doctor? Alhamdulillah. I think I taught you AA 100B and. Uh, and you were also with us in A to 30A, but for some reason you uh, perhaps dropped the course or something. Yes, I did. Yeah. I okay. had a very bad day. So I, dropped, I dropped for a, I got off for, for a semester. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you dropped entirely. I mean, you yes. also dropped the other courses. Welcome back. Um, thank, thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay. Tai. Nice. Um, I welcome you all to the course. This is, like I said, a very interesting course where we're covering a number uh, of uh, literary terrains, if you like. Um, we're going to um, cover a huge time uh, period. We're going to start with the medieval period, the Middle Ages, which is perhaps uh, um, somewhere in between the 11th, 12th, and uh, 13th century, and then we go all the way to the Renaissance or the, or the early modern period. Um, this is talking about perhaps the 14th and the 15th century up till the 17th century, and then we go to the 18th century, the age of enlightenment and reason, and then we conclude the whole effort with the early 19th century with the romantics. So as you can see, we're covering a lot. And I don't believe that we're covering this lot in a short time because we have we have time. It's not the summer that we're having. It's we're meeting perhaps for 12 or 13 month, uh, weeks and, and this is big. Um, again, uh, it's not only uh, time periods that we're covering, we're also uh, covering and addressing different genres. And by genre, I mean literary type. Let me give you an example. If, if I say literature, for example, uh, and under literature, uh, I have novels, I have plays, I have short stories, I have essays. These are all genres or literary genres and of course they can be even uh, subdivided into sub genres for example under plays or under drama you would have tragedies comedies comedy of manners and other stuff under novels you would have different types of novels when i uh, say epistolary novel when i say his, his uh, historical novels, um, you know, science fiction, thrillers, detective novels. So this is what we mean by genre or genres. So we're, we're, we're covering different genres. We're going to start off with plays. 
which is obviously a genre in and of itself. And then we move on to novellas, another genre. And then we move on to poetry and poems, a third genre. And then we conclude with a novel, which is a genre. So this is what we're doing. Uh, in terms of genres, in terms of forms. In terms of themes and ideas, uh, again, we have a diversity uh, of ideas and topics. We're going to start off with uh, some kind of background about the medieval period, uh, um, and then we set in the medieval period against the Renaissance and talk about the ideas uh, emanating from this kind of clash or conflict between the medieval period and the Renaissance. And then we move on uh, to uh, the Elizabethan age and we focus more on uh, ideas like um, order, uh, hierarchies, whether those hierarchies are hi hierarchies, uh, hierarchies of color, hierarchies uh, of social hierarchies, and then we move on to the 18th century, where the focus is obviously on, um, you know, advancement in, in science and in geography, geographical discoveries, um, inspired by the uh, belief in reason, absolute belief in reason. And then we move to the Romantics in the early 19th century, where obviously the focus is again on emotions, on the inner recesses of the human being and the poet, uh, where the focus is also on na uh, uh, is on nature, outside nature, the nature of the countryside. So again, lots of ideas, lots of concerns, as you're going to see in a minute. Um, okay, so let's talk about the things that we're going to cover together. Like I said, we have different time periods, and in every and each time period, we're going to have representative genres, uh, plays or novels or poems that reflect the time period and the age. And I'll give you what we're going to do, and I would like you to tell me whether you have heard of those things that I'm going to share with you or not. When I say, for example, Othello, when I drop the name and the title Othello, does Othello ring any bells at the back of your minds? Uh, yes, it's a, a, a play by, mm -hmm. by Shakespeare. It's, yeah, it's a play by Shakespeare. Nice, very good. What, what, what's your name? Sima? Or yes. Sima? Sima, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you're correct. Uh, Sima, uh, what you're saying is correct. Yes, Sima, uh, Othello is a play by William Shakespeare. What else do we know? Let's talk about, uh, let's talk to other people. How much else do we know about Othello? It talks about a person who is uh, suffering because of uh, racism and because mm -hmm. he doesn't look good or beautiful. Mm -hmm. So it's tragedy. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of things like Sima is saying. We're talking about uh, let's look at the name. When I say Othello, um, is it a European name? Is it like John, William, uh, Peter? Um, is it a European name? I mean, look at or perhaps hear the sound when I say Othello. Does, I think does it's it, German. Does it, does, it sound, does it sound European to you? No, I think it's from old German people. Uh, he, he's not, I mean, he's not European. And of course, if he's not European, he's not German, right? So let's establish the fact that we're talking about a non-European. We'll talk more about where he is from. Let's stop at that. So Othello is a play, and it's one of the plays that we're, we're dealing. Actually, it's the first one. When I say the Duchess of Malfi, does the name ring any bells? The Duchess of Malfi? Have you read it? The Duchess uh, of Malfi? Yeah, the Duchess, the Duchess of Malfi. 
So obviously you don't, you, you haven't done it, which is fine. I'm not testing you, mind you. Uh, when I say Candid, Candid, have you read Candid? Do you know who Candid is? Uh, do you know who the writer of Candid is? Okay, that's fine. Okay, when I say Wordsworth, so Wordsworth is is this a name of a person uh, or a name of a work? Doctor Candid is the nephew of the German Baron. No, mom, mom, we I'm studied not. Candid. Um, it's I think it's a love story or it's something written, like that. Sorry. It's written by Voltaire, I think. Yeah, it is written by Voltaire, and it has this love. Uh, interest in it. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, okay, nice. So Voltaire, let's talk about Voltaire. Is he English or what? Uh, French. He is French, okay. French. So if, if, if Candide is written by Voltaire, do you expect it to be written or to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, to have been written in English or French? French. So if it is French, how can we study it? In translation, right? It's going to be so, uh, maybe uh, what, to see what, uh, a version in English. Yeah, uh, what we're doing is is the translation. So it's a translated work. OK, nice. Let's move to Wordsworth and let's go to my original question about Wordsworth. Is Wordsworth the name of a person or the name of a work? Sorry, can you say it again, Doctor? Uh, Wordsworth, when I say Wordsworth, is Wordsworth the name of a person, an individual like me and you, or is it the title of a poem, for example, or the title of a play? I'm not sure, but I think it's a title. No, ma'am, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, it's not a title. <laughs> Uh, actually, Wordsworth is a poet, is an individual, and he is a poet, and we call him a romantic poet. We'll talk more about what romanticism is and who Wordsworth is. So Wordsworth, uh, for our present purposes, is a poet. Okay. When I say Frank Stein, does it ring any bells? Frank Stein. A person, yeah, he's a yeah, he's, he's a, a scientist, scientist and he is a person, a and, he, and he is a part of a novel, right? So, Frankenstein is a character, the character of the inventor or the creator of the scientist in the novel, uh, in a novel, and the novel has the same. By uh, name, I mean it's Frank Frankenstein. It's a household uh, novel. I mean, lots of people know about it. You don't have to have read it to know uh, um, uh, what what kind of feelings the the word Candide can can give. So, what kind of feelings, by the way, when I say Frankenstein, feel comfortable, you feel at ease, or you feel scary and Taken aback. Mm -hmm. hmm? Okay. Hmm. Mysterious. No, we'll we'll talk more about it. But let's uh, let's agree on the fact that it is scary because we're talking about uh, a man made or a man assembled human being. Can you imagine? Obviously, we have only one creator in the world, in the, which is God, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. to have a human being creating another human being, do you think he's going to be successful? Of course not. Of course okay. not. Okay. So uh, if we have this kind of creation, do you think he is going to be, um, you know, kind of 
handsome no. and nice looking, right? It's going to be jumbled up and things are not where they should be because not it's a, a human being. Yeah, which means that it it may seem scary, right? When you look at this, yeah, and it may give give you the creeps, like they say. You you, you your hair will stand on end. That's why sometimes we refer to this creature as the creature, and we refer to him as a monster. You know what a monster is? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's stop on this. But now this is going to be the last leg, the last thing that we're doing before we say bye bye. Right, let's go all the way back. Let's talk about the time period that we refer to at, as the Middle Ages. So we call it the Middle Ages, we call it the medieval period, and we also call it the Dark Ages. Okay. So when I say dark ages, let's agree on when this was. When I talk about the medieval period, I talk about the period after perhaps the 5th century to the 11th and the 12th century. See, it's a vast terrain again. And we refer to this period as dark ages medieval period when i say it is dark ages am i praising the period am i saying something good about it if i say the medieval no, period no. is the no. dark ages no it's not right okay why why do you think we're referring are we let me put it this way are we compare it to a period that was not dark before or after? Yes, I think that is yes. after, maybe. After. Yeah, absolutely. And even before, before the Middle Ages, we have um, the Romans and the Greeks, the classics. We had ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And those were great civilizations. And I'm sure you have done AA 100A where you have taken philosophy. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Do you still remember those guys? Yes. 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 They belong to ancient Greece. This was, of course, before uh, Christianity. Qabl al-Milad before the birth of Christ. So um, what did it look like? It was a great civilization. If you have philosophers, do you think that philosophers um, are, I mean, are educated or not? They were intellectual. Yeah, they yes, were very, very well educated. Okay, so that, 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 that time period before the Middle Ages, whether we're talking about ancient Greece or ancient Rome, they were highly educated. They were, there was lots of philosophy. There was lots of uh, natural science, chemistry, physics, biology. They were so advanced. Okay. And then came Christianity. Okay. And with Christianity, unfortunately, people started to interpret everything in terms of religion. Okay, so they are going, I mean, the mind and the reason is going to take a back seat. Okay, they are going to explain everything in terms of religion. Okay, so they are going to look back at the products and the books and the learning of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and they're going to say that that's full. Of, those guys were um, uh, polytheists. Polytheists mean that they believed in more than one God. So this is um, uh, kind of a religious. So we're going to discard and avoid the learning. Okay, so they didn't give the Greeks and the Romans a chance. They said, no, we're going to sweep aside all their learning, all their philosophies, all their sciences. 
Okay. So this is why the Middle Ages was was not such a great period because they have uh, kind of dropped all the sciences and all the philosophies and all the learning before them with ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And they focused on interpreting everything in terms of religion. And the clergy and the people who work in the church started to control everything. They became governments in and in, in, in themselves. They rule. You don't have a government. You don't have a queen. You have the church. You don't have a king. You have the church. And obviously, this is not an atmosphere that would encourage learning and advancement in medicine and in science. Okay, so that's why we're calling this period from perhaps the 6th century until the 11th and the 12th century. We call this period uh, the Dark Ages. Okay, so what are the characteristics of this period? It was, like I said, it was focused on religion. It was focused uh, uh, on um, following um, the people of the church, whatever they say. This was the time of the when the Catholic Church was in full sway. It was dominating. If you want to do something, you have to consult with your uh, nearest um, uh, parisher or uh, priest. Everything was done uh, uh, in terms of Christianity and religion. Okay. So what do you think if there is literature in the period? Do you think it's going to be advanced literature? No. No, it's going to reflect the period and the age. And the age is full of religion. It's full of moralizing. Do this and don't do that. Right? So the the uh, what do you think? Let, let's talk about the people. Do you think they are, they are going to be literate? They, they will be able to read and write? No, they, no. they were not able to think. Everything was not allowed. Yeah, everything was not allowed, even uh, um, education. There was no education in, 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 in any sense. So uh, the only people who are educated would, would, would be uh, the people of the church and their kids, perhaps, and their families and their limited circles. But the lay people, uh, people like you and me, are mere laborers they we, we don't know how to read and write so if you don't know how to read and write how can you read the bible how can you read your sacred book you're going to re to rely on somebody else who is this somebody else maybe they go to the church the church absolutely so the the church is going to control your life the church is going to tell you do this and don't do that Right? Okay. So if the level of illiteracy is high, people are not able to read and write. Uh, and we have a government and the government wants, wants to tell people about the laws of the land. Do this and don't do that. Follow the law. How? How can they communicate those rules and regulations to the people? If people if if there are no newspapers, of course, because people cannot read or write. Through church only. Through the, yeah, through the church. Yeah, very good. And also the church needs somebody to help her or to, ha to help it because it's not going to do everything. In this case, you will have literature coming in but what kind of literature it's going to be and, and then you you may want to stop me and say you said literature is meant to be read and you told us that those people cannot read or write right yes ah, okay so yes. how come you're yeah. contradicting yourself no i'm not contradicting myself because if you look at the genre that 
that is going to be widespread at the time, you will discover that I'm not contradicting myself. We're talking about the theater. We're talking about the stage, drama. So you, uh, at the time and even after, drama was designed to be watched. You don't read drama. You don't read a play like we're doing now. What do you do if you if you would like to enjoy a play or a drama? You go and watch it uh, um, uh, in the theater. It, yes. You go to the theater and watch it, right? And watch yes. it, yes. 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 So yes. when you watch it, you don't have to 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 read, read. right? Yes. yes. Or, yeah, you only watch. Okay. Yes. So you go and you have the playwright. The playwright is also one of us, he is also, uh, he was born in the Middle Ages. He knows about the ideas that are widespread and circulating. Okay, and the government may, you know, and the church may tell him, listen, we want people to understand this or that. Why don't you write a play around this? Why don't you write a play around that, right? So yes. the plays at the time, what do you think? Were those plays liberal? Liberal means that uh, they discuss um, big issues, science, uh, philosophy. No, I think no. The, the church, they give them... Yeah, uh, they the, the focus on that... religion. Yes, they yes. focus on religion. Do this and don't do that. Yeah. Okay. So those plays, do they have a name? Yes, we have two types of plays that were widespread at the time in the medieval period. One of them is called mystery plays, and the other is aptly named or called morality plays. Let's start with the morality play. So what do you think? Does the name morality play fit in the Middle Ages? Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah, because they, I mean, remember it's the church. Remember yeah. everything is uh, about religion and morality is part of religion, right? Yes. So what do you expect yes, people to have? You have themes and ideas also about morality. Morality in what sense? Uh, being greedy, if you're greedy, you know what greedy is. Greedy means that yes. you're possessive. You want to have more money and more food and more ev more everything. Is this moral or immoral? It's immoral. immoral. Immoral, right? Okay. If you hate other people and you, you are envious of them, I mean, they have money and you don't have, and you start to look at everything they do and um, you wish that they don't have the money anymore. Is this moral or immoral? Of course, immoral. Immoral, right? Immoral. Yeah. Right? If you're lazy, for example, you don't work, you do nothing. Is this moral or immoral? Immoral, for yes. sure. <laughs> uh, okay, so these, these, these ideas, uh, of course, the church and uh, the writers want you to stay away from them. Okay, so they create a play, a morality play, in which those negative qualities are embodied as human beings. Okay, like, like between the and, good and evil. Ah, yes. And so th these are the evil forces. And then on the other hand, you would have generosity. You would have kindness. You would have um, what? Um, uh, those m mercy, those good qualities, and they are also embodied, uh, and they are given human uh, shape. And then you have two forces in every and each play fighting. In a morality play, they fight. I mean, they don't fi fight. Um, um, in terms of ideas, they don't fight. It means that they are uh, killing each other. No, you have conflicts between them. Uh, who do you think should win at the end? The good or or the bad? The good yes, or the, the evil? The good guy. The, the good guy. Yes. Right. Yes. And this is normally 
the end, this was um, the the end for the the conclusion or the ending of all morality plays. The good uh, uh, always wins over the bad and the evil. So you have abstractions. Those abstractions are given human uh, embodiment. So obviously, what do you think? Is this complex? Is this subtle? Is this sophisticated kind of plays deep? Do you think this is deep enough? No, I think it talks about uh, uh, morals and general ideas and... Uh, yeah, if it's it. always like this. Yes. Uh, you can almost expect any morality play. If you walk into the, the theater, the you expect. So yeah. what happens if you're expecting everything? Does it make it nice? If no, you walk, it's gonna uh, be if, uh, if, if there no, is a movie released, for example, isn't is isn't part of the excitement is that you don't know what will happen in the movie, right? Yes. Yes, but if you if I tell you morality play, you can almost tell what is going to happen with yeah, small, definitely. small tweaking here and there. But it's the same thing. OK, this is morality play. And you also have what we call mystery plays, which is identical, more or less. And the word mystery here does not mean uh, um, weird or strange. Mystery at the time meant guilds and guilds are uh, associations uh, for carpenters, for couplers, for, for those professionals. So they had their own uh, uh, theaters. So again, because they, are, they were part of the Middle Ages where the focus is on the church, the, the themes and the ideas were also uh, about religion and about morality and all those kinds of things. Okay? So this is the Middle Ages, where the focus is, as you can see, uh, is on religion and morality and nothing else. No signs, no arguments, no philosophies, nothing. Please mute your mic. Let's move on. When we leave the Middle Ages, we go to the what we call the early modern times or the Renaissance. OK. And when I say the early modern times, it doesn't say much. But when I say the Renaissance, it says a lot. If, if you speak French, you can almost tell. How many of us uh, speak French or speak French? If you speak French, raise your hand. You don't have to. I'm, I'm just asking. <laughs> no, so okay. I just have a little uh, idea about it. Yeah, yes. Since I Nice. Well, so when I say Renaissance, does it sound French to you? Yeah. What's yes. your name? Julian. Julian. Yeah. So uh, any idea what Renaissance uh, or Renaissance mean, yeah, Julian, from the sound of it? Um, yeah, it seems it's a, it's a French uh, word, but uh, mm. I have no idea about uh, That's the meaning. That's fine. Then. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. We checked because I don't speak much French anymore. Um, um, you have it, it comes from I mean, or, or, or it simply means rebirth. So you have birth, and you have the prefix re. Of course, you know that re means repeat, right? When something gets yes. repeated, so. There is a, a birth and it gets repeated. So obviously it's about reviving something. Something was there and it's decadent and it's not used anymore. It's morbid. Uh, and you are giving it a lease of life. You are reviving interest. So what do you think? So what is it that we want to revive interest in? The Middle Ages? Or what? So, of course, you cannot revive interest or make rebirth for something in the future because you're not repeating here because the future is not there yet. We're not there yet, right? 
So the only time that you have is the past. And we spoke about two time periods in the past. Spoke about the medieval times, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. This is one. And what was the other time period that we spoke about? Uh, the Dark Ages. Now, uh, this is what we early said. Morning, early modern? No. What, the time period that we're talking about is the early modern times. Yes. Okay, which we refer to as Renaissance. So we're going to mm -hmm. revive interest in something. We're going to renew interest in something. Okay, Victorians? so of course... Mm -hmm. In Victorian scenario for the future, the only two things that I spoke about today were the Middle Ages and the Greeks and the Romans. <laughs> Remember? What yes. did we say about the Greeks and the Romans? Were they advanced or not? Remember their philosophies, their science, natural science, Aristotle, Plato, were these people great or not? Not. Of course they were. Go back to my recording when I finish it and you'll see that I'm saying very nice things about them. Yeah, Rahaf. So we're reviving interest in the learning of the Romans and the Greeks, because they were great. Okay? Yes. So this is what we mean by the Renaissance. We are um, um, renewing interest in those things. We, we are going to go all the way back to them and read their literature and read their philosophies and read their natural sciences and get inspired by it and then we start to build on it in the renaissance or the early modern times that's why we're saying that the early modern times um, a very interesting thing so where can we find their works their learning obviously there is a huge gap and distance that separates us from the greeks and the romans Right, we are in the 14th and the 15th century, and they were uh, before Christianity, Ablil Milad. So, when the church came, what did the church do with the books? Did they keep them? They burned the they books. Kept no, them. No, yeah, they they kept them. They burned. They didn't uh, even uh, uh, kind of preserve them. Hmm. Who is going to step in and help the Europeans? Can you imagine it's the Muslims and the Arabs? We're talking about, remember, we're talking about the medieval or Middle Ages, and we said that it, it started from perhaps the 6th or the 5th century until the 13th century. In the middle, you would have the Arabs and the Muslims and the Muslim empire whether we're talking about the Umayyads or whether we're talking about the, the um, al Abbasin, I don't know what name, yeah, Abbasids, uh, dynasties. Those people did Europe a great service. What did they do? They went all the way to the Greeks and the Romans and they translated their work. Okay? And then the Europeans started to read the translations and that's why they learned what they learned and that's why they have started this uh, huge civilization that we're seeing now let's go back so we're talking about the early modern times we're talking about the renaissance which started in the 14th century where did it start it started in italy but did it stop there? Absolutely not. It went to the other parts of Europe. Obviously, we're not interested in the other parts of Europe. We're focused on England because this is English literature. Okay, and we're focused in this time period within the Renaissance that we call the Elizabethan age. So the Elizabethan age is the time between perhaps the 15th and the 16th century. 
and part of the 17th century, 16 and 17th century, part of the 17th century, when Queen Elizabeth I was ruling England. Okay, so Queen Elizabeth and her age is part of the Renaissance. So what, what, what kind of learning do you think they will have? What kind of arts and literature? Is it going to be advanced or uh, like the Middle Ages? It's going to be advanced. Yeah, they, yeah. Um, they, uh, I mean, she and the age are inspired by the new discoveries in science. Uh, people are more interested in uh, the natural sciences in physics and uh, uh, um, in geograph geography and geographical discoveries. So it was uh, and it, it was times of learning, times of liberal arts. Uh, like yeah, okay. Dr. Faustus, uh, Dr. Faustus play was conducted yeah. in the Elizabethan yes. era. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Faustus is an Elizabethan drama or play written by Christopher Marlowe, who, who was uh, a contemporary to Shakespeare. And Shakespeare and Marlowe were uh, Elizabethan uh, or been, they belong to the Elizabethan age. Um, okay, so we now have a shift from the Middle Ages, where, where, where the focus is on religion and morality, to the Renaissance and Elizabethan age, where, where the focus is on the liberal arts, where the focus is on learning, where the focus is on uh, scientific discoveries and advancement in the different sciences. So let's talk about the literature of the, th the time. Do you think the literature of the time is going to be like the literature of the medieval time, the Middle Ages, morality plays and mystery plays? What do you think? No, they will not be no, the no, same. No, no, it's going to they reflect. Yeah. It's going to reflect the spirit of the age. What is the spirit of the age? Science, right? What is the spirit of the age? Discoveries. Uh, what is the spirit of the age? Going beyond the confines and the borders of Europe, going to other countries and other continents, discovering uh, America, for example, going all the way to India, going all the way to Arabia. Isn't that advancement and progress? Yes, it, it, yes, it is. Okay. So what do you think um, the arts and let's focus on the literature. Do you think that so it's, the literature is, is not going to be limited anymore. The themes and the ideas are going to be wide ranging. It's not only morality and the, they are going to talk about governance. They are going to talk about how uh, uh, perhaps people can govern themselves. They're, we're going to talk about relationships. They are going to talk about um, you know, the idea of order in society, how order can be maintained. They are going to talk about hierarchies in society. So obviously these are ideas and themes that uh, we haven't seen in the Middle Ages, right? Um, okay, um, so if we have literature, um, and of course, when we talk about literature, we talk about different genres. We talk about poetry, we talk about the drama. Uh, and during the time, the, the, the genre of choice, the genre that people agreed on and liked was drama. Most, expected. Yeah, most of the work or most of the works were drama, were plays. Yes. Especially one type of play that we now call tragedy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tragedy was the form, the dramatic form of choice during the Renaissance and during the Elizabethan age. That's why we have people like Shakespeare, who is a dramatist. That's why we have people like Christopher Marlowe, who is a dramatist. That's why we have people like Thomas Kidd who is also a dramatist. Um, again, the themes are big. 
they are not any more limited to uh, moral things. There is, of course, morality involved, but there is obviously more to the dramas of the time than just uh, moral ideas. Um, okay, so this this was the Elizabethan age. Immediately after the Elizabethan age, we're going to have what we call Jacobian age. The Jacobian age is the time uh, of uh, King James the first, and he was also. Um, you know, a promoter of the sciences. He wasn't as good, of course, as Elizabeth the first. And uh, because the time between the two is not big, he the same characteristics applied. There was also interest in the sciences. Uh, and there was also interest in discoveries and, and everything. So the drama of the time is going to be uh, it's going to be almost the same. We're going to also have tragedies, as we're going to see. So, um, in the uh, Elizabethan age, we will have the tragedy. And of course, the themes and the ideas are going to be more liberal, uh, are going to be more, perhaps, uh, uh, secular. The focus is on life here and now, not life uh, in the past or in the hereafter. So you would have real human concerns. Talk about relationships between a man and his wife and the domestic sphere. We talk about the idea of inheritance. We talk about women and their issues and how they have been subjugated all through and whether there are solutions for this perennial problem or not. We talk about the idea of race. Uh, if um, a dark individual wants to get married to uh, a white girl, for example, is that acceptable or not? We talk about the idea of hierarchies and society. The fact that you have on top, you would have the king or the queen, and then you have nobles, and then uh, people like me and you, and then you have the poor, for example. And we talk about the whether there are possibilities that you can climb up the social ladder and become something or not. We talk about the idea of colors, for example. You would have people who are white on top, and then you have people who are perhaps yellow and then down to people who are black. And that interaction between them, is it possible that a black individual uh, falls in love with a white girl and they eventually get married? We ask these questions. These are questions that we wouldn't have asked in the medieval period. Again, because it was all white uh, during the medieval period. Uh, people didn't go outside their limited circle in Europe. That's why you wouldn't have black people coming up in order to work in Europe. But during the Renaissance, there was this idea of open bo borders. You would have people coming from Africa, from uh, India, and they would go and work in Europe. And of course, there is going to be in encounters and the likelihood that people fall in love with each other is very high, right? Uh, okay, so are we having representative works or literary works from the medieval period? The answer is no. Our real start would be the Renaissance and the focus is obviously on the Elizabethan age. The Elizabethan and the Jacobian ages. What do we have uh, that represent this time period? We have two plays. We have Othello by Shakespeare, which represents the Elizabethan age. And we have uh, the Duchess of Malfi representing the Jacobian age by uh, Webster, John Webster. Okay, are we clear about this? Is that clear at the back of your minds? 
Yes. Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. Yes. Okay. Let's let me share my slides, and we are on our way. So this is me. This is A two thirty A, and this is my name. Um, I have covered that. I'm, I'm not going to revisit it. Let's talk about it later. Okay. Uh, what I was talking about is obviously. I, I was talking about. Did I talk about texts? By a text, I mean a play, a poem, a novel. Was I? I mean, I, we've been together for the past hour or so, right? Did I talk about text? Did I tell you what Othello is about? Did I tell you what the Duchess of Malfi is about? Did I discuss them yet? I think what do you not think? yet. I've not been yet. late okay. for 10 minutes, so I don't know. I'm not sure, but... I'll... No, no, yes. okay. I didn't. I, did. I didn't talk about text. When I say... Othello, this is a text. When I say the Duchess of Malfi, this is a text. When I say uh, Candide, th this is a third text. But I haven't done any of them. I haven't discussed any of them yes. yet. Yes. What I have been discussing was the context. Yes. The context would be the time period, would be the time and the place in which those texts happened or took place or were written. I, when I talk about the history uh, of uh, a certain play, that the time in which the play was written, when when I speak about the ideas and the ideology that that an ideology that was widespread, this is called a context. Okay, okay? so could 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 we have started? the text without the context? No, we need to know about the yes. context. Uh, could, the yeah, could I have started Othello right away? No. No, so the context provides you with much needed background, background that you no. need, so that in order to connect the dots, right? Yes. So you wouldn't... Uh, quite understand why people are reacting aggressively against the idea that Othello wants to marry or perhaps got married already to Desdemona. Desdemona is white and Othello is dark or black. It, you wouldn't understand because you, you're, you're looking at it from a 21st century perspective. And in the 21st century, obviously, there is nothing wrong or bad about a dark guy getting married to a white girl or a, a dark girl getting married to a white uh, man, right? In the yes. 21st century, we don't have a problem with that. So if I don't provide you with a context telling you that uh, during the time they have what we call uh, the chain of being, uh, they have established order. They have the idea of hierarchy where if you're white, you are on top. And if you're black, you are at the, the bottom. bottom. <laughs> and then if you try to reach out to the top and get married to the one you love who happens to be white, you're making a great mistake. And pr I promise you, you will not get away with it. If I don't tell you this, if I don't provide this background, you would say, hey, what's wrong with that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you come fresh from the 21st century, right? Yes. Mm. Okay, so that's why context is very important. That's why context matters, like they say. Let's move on. So what we're doing is a Renaissance drama, obviously. And we're perhaps more specific. We're talking about love and death in the Elizabethan and the Jacobian age and, 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 and the dramas that represent uh, those ages. And of course, we have representative plays. Remember when I said if we, I talk about the Elizabethan age, I'm talking about Othello. 
if we talk about uh, Jacobian drama and the Jacobian age, we're talking about the Duchess of Malfi. Okay. And we said that the, the two time periods and the two ages are almost identical in the, the climate of ideas, almost the same ideas, the idea of established order, the idea of hierarchy, the idea of um, um, liberal thoughts and ideas. OK, so wasn't one play enough because you're saying that they are identical and they are very similar? No, actually, no. Why? Why? Because Othello is going to be telling me about uh, um, this idea of race and color, while the Duchess of Malfi is going to tell me about the idea of class, Taba'a, high class, middle class, low class. So Othello is about white and black, while the Duchess of Malfi is about different classes but they they have the self same structure or line as we're going to see so it's othello and the duchess of malfi again what do the two plays have in common they are both tragedies uh, and they both have characters who marry beneath the rank and status and this is very important. So they are tragedies and tragedies in the technical sense. I'm not talking about suffering here and pain. Uh, of course, there are, there, there are going to be a lot of suffering and pain, I promise you. But this is not what we mean by a tragedy. A tragedy is a technical term. It's a dramatic form that was widespread in the Elizabethan and in the Jacobian times. Um, okay, so both have characters who marry beneath, beneath means under the rank and status. How? Let's look at Othello, for example. Remember what I told you about Othello? Othello is black. If we have a hierarchy, you know what a hierarchy is? Um, and I would like, I'll give you, I'll give you Othello. And I'll give you uh, uh, this Dumona and uh, a third character by the name of Iab. And I'm telling you that Othello is black, while Iab and this Dumona are, are white. And I'll give you this hierarchy. And I would like you to put them where they belong. What do you think? If we have top and bottom in this hierarchy, this Demona will Dumona, be at the top. Yeah, this Demona and Iago will be at, at the top, That's right? right? Yes. While yes. Othello is going to be at the bottom. At the bottom, yes. Okay, can we tell from now what will happen to them if they try to reach out, if Othello falls in love with this Demona or if this Demona falls in love with, is it possible? It's not at that time. It's not. At that time, was not. Possible. No, right. What happens if they insist? Will they get away with it? Do we consider a crime? Yeah, it's a. We call it, it's bigger than a crime. We call it a transgression. Oh. It's a transgression. It's a violation of something big. Yeah. Will they get away with it? Of course not. No, they will yes. not. Yes. They will not. So can you expect can you expect the end from now? What do you think the end will be like? Execution. Um, they they will be forced to execute each other, which means that Othello is going to uh, to think or to uh, is going to be made to think that this Dumona is betraying him. Okay, what will what will he do? He is going to kill her, strangle her. And um, the moment he kills her, he realizes that she was innocent. So in order to kind of atone for his sin, he kills himself. 
Okay, so that would be a lesson for any uh, uh, people. It's uh, the obviously the lesson is never go there. Never fall in love with a white girl if you're uh, dark. Right? Never fall for a dark man if you are a white girl. So this was the thinking of the time, the logic of the time. So this is, uh, like I said, this is Othello. Let's move to the Duchess of Malfi. Is it the same thing? Uh, let's 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 uh, break it down. The Duchess of Malfi is a tragedy where you have a duchess. Duchess is the equivalent of queen in Italy because the play is set in Italy. Um, they don't have kings and queens. They have dukes. The, a duke is like a king, and they have duchess. And the duchess is like a queen. So you have a duchess. Where would you put the duchess? On top or at the bottom of the ladder? Or on the top. On, on top. So uh, when we meet the duchess at the beginning, she is widowed. Her husband died. Okay. So obviously there is nothing wrong with getting married again. Is there anything wrong with that? Suppose not. No. Okay. But provided that you choose the right person, who would be the right person? Somebody from her class and level or somebody from beneath uh, her level and from class? Her class. From her yeah. class. From what her class. Yeah. What happens if she decides to get married to, some, uh, to one of her stewards, one of her, her assistants? She is she's the queen. And she decides to uh, get married to one of her, her helpers. Um, the, this helper is obviously a low-born uh, individual. What do you think? Is that the right thing to do? No, sure. She will okay. face many problems. Uh, she will face many problems. And eventually, what do you think will happen to her? Maybe she will be punished. Yeah, severely, I promise you. And she she got punished. She got killed in Act Four. She was executed. Right? What's the message here? Should we should we go ahead and do like her? No. No, they no, right? shouldn't. Yes. 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 Okay. So in order to uh, uh, give you all these messages. They choose the form of tragedy. Why did they choose tragedy? Because obviously tragedy is a serious art form, right? And tragedies are, the, the, the trajectory is like this. They have a clear path. You move from fortune to misfortune. You move from fortune to adversity. Fortune means that when we meet you as the protagonist or the main character, you are happy, you are exceptional, you are talented, you are a queen or a king or a military leader or a prince. Nice, right? Money, uh, happiness, everything. Uh, perhaps you're handsome or beautiful, right? But, well, as you go along, you make an error or a mistake. Um, first of all, you're, you're, you're exceptional in everything. You're great, but you have a, a flow. You have a tragic flow. Flow means weakness. It can be that you're hot-tempered. It can be that you're a bad judge of characters. It can be that you are proud it can be that you are what else you are um, remember you are you're arrogant like dr faustus so this is i mean you're good and everything but you have this flow and this flow would prompt you would push you to make 
errors and mistakes. And one of those errors and mistakes is fatal. Fatal means deadly. And you have to pay for this error or mistake by, by uh, falling uh, tragically at the end, where you normally die. And you don't die in bed. You die, you get killed, or you kill yourself. See? So this is the trajectory of any tragedy. Don't you think that this is this is very suitable to the ideas that we've been speaking about, about Othello uh, and the Duchess? Yes. When you look at Othello, you tell me Othello is black. Uh, where is that, that grandeur and this exceptionalism that you're talking about? I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, wait, wait a minute. Othello is a great soldier. Like uh, Antar ibn Shaddad, kida. he is um, a military leader. Everybody is talking uh, or speaking very highly of him. Yeah, it is true that he is not from Venice, where the play is. He's not European, but everybody is uh, grateful uh, to him. They say they uh, he has defended our country, Venice. And he has been great. So when we meet Othello, he is such a wonderful individual, regardless of how black he is. And he is good, and everybody is obviously uh, on in agreement that he is a great man. And then we move on. Uh, typical of tragedies, he has a flaw in his character. He has a weakness. And what's this weakness? It can be many things. One of them is the feeling that he is insecure. Insecure? You're talking about a military, a military leader and he is insecure? Yes. He was made to feel insecure. If you get to know that he is twice the age of this demon, if you get to know that he is white and he is black, if you get to know that Venice is obviously uh, full of white people, perhaps he's the only black individual there, you would feel different, right? Uh, and of course, uh, this idea of color can sometimes be very difficult. When you um, made to feel that you don't belong to this society because they are white and you're black, when you made to feel that city life is different from uh, life in the deserts and in the seas where you all the time fighting people and killing and so he has this sense of insecurity okay and he also has a flow I and mean, he's not, perhaps he's not a very uh, he doesn't calculate very well he should have seen that coming. Getting married to a white girl is not for me because I'm black, for example. This can be a miscalculation, right? So what will happen? Would that affect? Absolutely. When he gets married to this demona, he is going to, to kind of uh, give his ears to people who would tell him, listen, she's young and you're old. She's white and you're black. She is a citizen of Venice and you are not. Um, and then, and every time he sees her standing with somebody who is, and this somebody is white, he's going to feel jealous. Yeah, perhaps they are in love. Perhaps they have an affair. And somebody is going to come over and start to insinuate to him that his wife is not um, perhaps reciprocating love. Uh, his wife is in an affair with somebody. And he, he is going to be, he's going to believe this guy, Iago, and he's going to strangle or kill her. See? And of course, he's going to realize that she was innocent. And 
he is going to commit suicide and kill himself. See? So the tragedy, I mean, the framework of a tragedy is very appropriate. So what do we call the protagonist in a tragedy? We call him the tragic hero. So Othello is the tragic hero in Othello, the play. Okay? How about if we apply all of that to the Duchess of Malfi? Um, you would ask, but we don't have uh, we don't have a hero, right? We don't have a male hero. You you told us the female that hero is wait, uh, called the wait, heroine. Wait, wait, wait. We're saying that tragedies are about heroes, not heroines. Isn't that strange? That we have a heroine because you told us that the Duchess of Malfi is the one who calls the shots, is the one who cho chooses to get married to somebody beneath. So obviously she is the hero. Is that uh, normal? Is that usual in during the times? Absolutely not. No. Okay. So perhaps for the first time ever, we have a heroine, not a hero. We have a tragic heroine. Okay? So in the Duchess of Malfi, we have the tragic heroine. Or if, if she is a duchess, uh, do you think at the beginning she is happy and everything? Yeah. No. Yeah, because she has all... Uh, she has everything. She is the queen of the land. She orders people to do things for 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 her, and right? She is ruling. She's a ruler, a queen. Um, and then over time, she's exceptional also because we're going to see this. She is a very good judge of characters. She knows how to uh, defend herself and others. She she is very. Uh, eloquent, and she has this strength of character. Well, but she has a flaw. She has a weakness, typical of tragic heroes and heroines. What is her flaw? This is something that we may debate and talk more. You can come up with your own set of flaws, and I can come up. If you ask me, her flaw would be that she she is also a miscalculator. Doesn't she know that she cannot marry beneath her status and rank? Does she know or she doesn't know? What do you think? Sure, she knows. She knows. She knows. She knows. Okay. So knows. if you know, and if you know what the consequences, what will happen if you insist on doing it the wrong way, is is this? Good. Isn't that a miscalculation? Yes. Which is obviously a, a flaw. If you insist on doing something that everybody is telling you wrong, obviously, uh, and this is the, 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 you're perhaps very stubborn, right? Mm -hmm. And that would, uh, being stubborn would make or prompt her to do something at the time very bad, which is getting married to somebody beneath her rank, Antonio, who is a low born. She's high born and he's low born. Okay, so she's moving from fortune, from happiness to misfortune and adversity. What is the misfortune at the end? The tragedy she's going, she, uh, yeah, she's going to be tortured physically and mentally and psychologically, and then she will be killed at the end. See? Okay. So what about uh, us as audience? We are members of the audience. We go to the theater and see all these things. These are obviously excessive emotions that we feel 
we go up with the characters and we go down. We feel for them. We want to defend them. We want to do this, right? We get excited about what is happening. This is actually the aim of the tragedy. It makes you get excited with what is happening in the play. You feel for the characters. You try to perhaps I mean, to alert them that, that danger is in their uh, uh, is behind them, and you feel pity and fear. Those are the two two main feelings that you have in a tragedy: pity and fear. So, why would you feel pity? For the tragic hero, whether we're talking about Othello, whether we're talking about the Duchess, you feel pity because, because yeah, of, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Because this kind of plays, as you said, it's serious and it uh, reflect our lives. So that's why. No, this is not. This this uh, perhaps may be one of the reasons, but this is not the main reason. You still you feel pity because who are you seeing? You're seeing people like yourself. Remember, they are human beings. And they make or they made errors and mistakes. We are like them. We are also vulnerable, right? We can make errors and mistakes. Can't we? Yes. Are we are we perfect? No. No, we may be tested in our own way like them and we may take the self same decisions and we insist so we feel pity because they are human beings like us and we may have been in their positions and may we may have acted the way they did and we may have met the same destiny being killed at the end this is the pity that we feel and of course, if you feel pity, you feel fearful. When you think of these ideas, I may be killed. Yeah, this is fear, of course, right? So these are the two main feelings that you have or emotions that you have towards the end. So you feel those things. You have those ups and downs. So that when you go out of the theater, you have those excessive feelings cleansed and burst. You leave the theater with those excessive feelings spent, released. You go back home, uh, I mean, relieved, let me put it this way. And this is what we call catharsis. So catharsis is about the audience and for the audience. Okay. Uh, but doctor, are we allowed to be judgmental for these characters? I mean, to judge them? No, it's not judging as much as it is assessing what they did and say, yeah, perhaps they were wrong for this and that reason. Perhaps they were correct for this and that reason. I wouldn't call it judgment. I, call, I would call it assessment. Okay. Okay. So this is the trajectory. Um, these are the two representative plays that we're doing this semester, representing the uh, um, you know uh, Renaissance drama, uh, representing um, both uh, Elizabethan and Jacobian dramas. We'll talk, of course, more about that. We're going to break the two plays down to their basic components. And a lot of other issues will arise. The idea of women, how women were treated. Uh, we're going to have those comparisons between assertive women and women who are non-assertive. Uh, we're going to talk about the idea of hierarchies, whether those hierarchies are hierarchies of colors, hierarchies of rank, the idea of a chain of being, the idea of transgression, 
doing something uh, defying the expectations of society. Society expected you to behave in a certain way and you behave in a different way. And you may have your uh, views. You may, um, I think we agree that not everything that we have in society is correct, right? But let's talk about the limit of that. And these are issues that we're going to debate together, inshallah. Um, um, I don't want to spoil it for you. I would like you to read Othello. That's why I'm not going to give you the plot. Um, I have already um, given you some um, you know, spoils. <laughs> but I want you to either read the play, and if you have a chance to watch it, that would be also fine. And I would like you to, to keep the context that I provided in mind. Again, we're assessing, not judging. Look at the character of this Demona and how she, whether she develops all through. Look at the character of Othello. Look at how people uh, treat him at the beginning. Look at the character of Iago and what kind of role he plays in perhaps bringing about the downfall of Othello. And whether you think that Iago is responsible for the downfall, because this is going to be one of the main ideas, the idea of whether Othello, the character, is responsible for his downfall, or is it external forces like Othello, for example, um, <clears throat> you know, pushing him um, and insinuating and telling him that your wife is not uh, who you think she is and stuff like that. We'll have this debate and we'll have, you know, uh, critics on either side, those who believe that Othello is responsible and those who believe that uh, um, Othello is not responsible for what happened to him. Uh, read the play, enjoy it, uh, and I'm going to stop on this, on this note. But before I stop, I'll give you perhaps five more minutes so that you can give me whatever questions you may have. But before we do that, I think we need to create a WhatsApp group so that I can uh, perhaps share the recordings and, and the slides and everything in between. So who is going to volunteer and create a WhatsApp group for us? I already have created the group, Doctor, and I sent it back uh, I replied uh, for your message yes. the link of the group yes uh, I think yeah um, I think mm. you sent me something like a couple of days ago right yes uh, yeah. okay and so how can other people join your group yeah Juliana uh, I, I just uh, check if they if they can if it's possible for them to uh, to contact me private uh, send me uh, private can can mm -hmm. can can you put the link in the chat box now and I they did. can I, I did now. Yes. Can we can we make sure that everybody is pressing the link? If you have done so, raise your hand. I, I just I, I, I just need the, the end four uh, uh, numbers, four digits uh, of each number so mm -hmm. I can accept all all of them. Right. And Can I you will do that? check their names. Yeah, and that's that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, would you like my my um, the 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 last four digits of my number two? Or like, of course, doctor. And, and, <laughs> and how can I join? Type. I think we're done. We don't need the recording anymore. Let me stop the recording and then share yes. my number with everyone.